What is the or what are the origins of the scientific method, and how did that come about? That is the subject of today's episode. Welcome back to Shia Sophia, your home for raw, unfiltered, informal science. I'm Adrian, climate scientist, crafter, amateur philosopher. I don't actually have the scientific method up first. I actually have something else that I'm going to touch on a little bit as it pertains to the history of the scientific method, which is very complicated and its origins are very interesting, actually, when you really seriously dive into it. There's actually some disagreement about who is the father of the scientific method um, in, in the history books. So we're going to get into that a little bit here today, along with some of my opining of what the scientific method is and... and um, and uh, what societies value it. Um, so values, when we're talking about values, we are talking, of course, about a person's principles or standards of behavior, the judgments of what is important in life. And that can be on the individual level, but yes, it can also be different societies and cultures and the things that they value. Do they value family? Do they value freedom? Do they value liberty? Or do they not? It can be That's a choice of the individuals, but that's also the choice of the collective of society and what they value. Uh, values also, you know, they motivate people to act in ways, um, they serve as a guide for human behavior. Typically, if you have something that you're valuing, like if you value money over all else, that's what you're going to go after. You're going to chase after what gets you the most money. But if you value truth and reason and objectivity, you might go into science and be a scientist and want to understand how things work in the world and what is the truth about a particular phenomena that you observe. Um, some of these values can be really sacred. Like you're not going to compromise on that. I don't compromise necessarily on freedom of speech or individual, um, freedom and liberty and intellectual freedom, um, and academic diversity, which is kind of, um, kind of uh, lacking at this point. I, and I mean that particularly in diversity of thought. Um, and so it gets interesting that way. Um, values that are sacred, they can, they can vary among individuals across cultures over time. Human history is very long and has evolved in a lot of ways. And what we valued 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago is not necessarily the same as what we value now. Um, you know, we also have oops, we also have the uh, the etymology of the word. As you know, I'm a big fan of the roots of words. In the case of value, one of the things that we one of the things that we have with that word is it's uh, circa 1300 um, price equal to the intrinsic worth of the thing, the light 14th century, the degree to which something is useful or estimable, the old French value is the worth price, moral worth, standing, reputation. It comes from the noun, um, use of the feminine past participle of valor, uh, be worth, the Latin valere, um, be strong, be well, be of value, <laughs> be worth. Circular definitions, again, is always annoying to see. Sorry, my pet peeve there. Um, here with that, I prefer not to have circular defining of things, which is aggravating um, in, in all of this mess. So my point here with this is I just want to emphasize is individuals have things that they value. Um, and they can be just about anything. You can, you can value evidence and reason and the scientific and, and an emphasis on the scientific method as a way to acquire knowledge and determine the truth of particular aspects of phenomena of life. And I don't know why that is there. I've got to get an ad blocker note self. <laughs> I've got weird things that show up in ads. Okay. Um, so you can value these things or you can not value these things. It's entirely your choice as an individual. It's also entirely the choice that you make as a society. Uh, American culture tends to value freedom and liberty and um, many of the things espoused in the Declaration of Independence, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness uh, are things that we value. We want, to, we want to live our lives freely. We want to pursue happiness freely, um, those kinds of things. So, And the same can be said of those if you value the scientific meth method or you emphasize that the scientific method should be used um, in decision making and helping score provide evidence, then yeah, that's something that you value. And I value it as a scientist. The scientific method is incredibly important to me. So it was fun diving into this really long history. But first off, what is it? <laughs> well, um, Britannica has one definition. There's actually a couple of different definitions if you go searching around online for exactly what the scientific method is. Um, it's mathematical uh, experimental technique um, employed in the sciences. Um, and 
particularly used in the constructing of a scientific hypothesis. And typically, actually, you you have a hypothesis first, and then you do your experiment on the hypothesis. So I'm going to say this is backwards in Britannica's um, thing here. But <laughs> one of the um, one of the I, I actually like what Britannica wrote down here more though is the process of observing asking questions and seeking answers through tests and experiments and analysis and reasoning and arguments um, is not, it's definitely not unique to any one field of science. You can find it in social sciences. Certainly you can find it in my field in climate science a lot nowadays. Um, Of course, in in a lot of the empirical sciences in particular, um, there will be the scientific method. Um, The exact approaches are different across the different things because obviously a social scientist is working with different data than I would as a climate scientist. And now, of course, it's getting really, really interesting in how you apply the scientific method because we're starting to ask questions that cross disciplines from the social sciences and the physical sciences at the same time. For instance, a paper that I was a part of actually was asking, you know, uh, do do uh, people have the same perception of how the climate is going to change as what is suggested by climate science um, in the climate modeling world and what have you? And that was a very interesting study that we ended up doing and publishing that um, showed that most people don't have the same perception of how uh, the future is going to be different or um, the climate is going to change in their area. Um, and that makes sense. Um, because they're not necessarily exposed to all of that data and information the way that I am. So, hey, that's a point. Um, It's really critical that the scientific method can be used to help create theories and theories that make sense of the world around us in particular um, with different phenomena, be they about people or about physical phenomena like the climate or the earth itself or, or meteorology or any number of different fields. Um, So, I mean, we... We typically, we have our hypothesis, we test it through very diff- very many different means, um, and then you know, modify it, come, come to a conclusion. But one of the things you'll notice in a lot of the scientific papers is that there's lots of different um, discussion sections where they go through their reasoning of what they think is the reason why something happened in their experiment and what they think is the reason that something didn't um, go the way they thought it would. And then make suggestions, of course, you know, this is what... Um, this is what we ex- we suggest doing for future research or what we are going to do for future research. So there is always that, too, um, from there. In, and it, it makes things certainly very interesting. Um, the scientific method itself, coming here from the Plato um, Center at Stanford, it's interesting because we should, should distinguish it a little bit. Um, from the products of science, because it's something that science does as a process itself is figuring out, you know, figuring out knowledge, what is true about the world, what is true about the questions that we want to ask. And scientific methods, you know, we have our rules, and they include in them, a lot of the scientific method does include the idea of objectivity, reproducibility, simplicity, or even the past successes that we have um, in here methodological rules that are proposed to govern a method and its methodological question of whether the methods obey those rules um, satisfy given values. There's a, there's a lot of philosophical jargon in there. It's, it's to say the method has to meet what we value um, in here. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting discussions in the last half century, and I would actually argue longer than that after I've been reading in the history here of, you know, how pluralist does it need to be? Um, do you need one method that works exactly for everybody? There is an argument out there, um, particularly in the last 10, 10, 15, 20 years um, or so in the 20th century, I should say. And so the last tw- in the 20th century th- saying that there is no one method that works for every field of science. And, and to, to a degree, that's true just because of the data part of it. But can you follow a similar process? So because of that, how I'm going to characterize the scientific method here is it is a process by which we answer questions and determine the truth about those questions and phenomena that we observe in the world around us. It is a very step-by-step process um, that we go through. 
um, to answer questions, um, gathering data and information around the world around us and collecting it with our own knowledge. If you recall from my last episode with the what is an expert, one of the things that's important in critical thinking is the idea of what base knowledge do you have and what more do you need? You start with doubt in critical thinking, according to Dewey, uh, which comes from a bit of knowledge that you already have paired with Hirsch there. And then you get to the idea of, okay, you have doubt, get more data, seek more data, pair it with the knowledge you already have, come to a conclusion. That kind of thing might be universal, but the exact application of that method may not be. And that's what I'm more concerned about, is the idea of that sort of step-by-step process of, in the scientific method kind of framework, the step-by-step process of how do we go about acquiring knowledge um, here? And where did that sort of idea for a process came about and which cultures can we say here valued the idea of having a process by which to answer questions and gain knowledge of the world around them because that is fundamentally what the scientific method is it is a process by which we answer questions and gather knowledge of the world around us um and that includes a human you know human human experience a human world um as an organizational psychologist, I know would, would would agree to would agree to well, I don't know that she would agree. I'm not going to put words in her mouth, but um, is a you you can apply the same method to human knowledge gathering, um, gathering information about the human experience. I should say that's a better way to put it. Um, but you could also apply it to just a given given kind of process here. Um, so it's it's interesting to see. Um, as we talk through history and history itself, there shows so many different ways of thinking about the world around us um, and the methods that have the, the variations of the scientific method that have formed. Um, so with that, let's get right into the history. I'm going to be very brief and summarizing things. I invite you to do your own research. I encourage you to do your own research. It's really, really fascinating to go and dig through because some of some folks would argue like I'm not interested as much in this question the who's the father of the scientific method I'm not really interested in that as much as the idea that where did the or where did the idea come from and which cultures valued that because there's I don't think there's any one culture as you'll see as we talk about it that s- put a stamp on there and say this is the process this is the process. No, they valued a process. And then with the evolution of our values and the change and growth of history, uh, human history, we, we sort of defined that method more carefully and we continue to define it. It is not a solid state. This is exactly what it is. The scientific method has grown and changed as we've added new ways of reasoning, um, on top of it. Um, though typically we tend to focus on the inductive and deductive forms that Aristotle provided, but, um, it's not the only ways we do it. And actually we're going to see there's a lot of things that influence what we know is the modern scientific method. And a lot of cultures actually really valued the idea of having some kind of a process as we're talking about it. And as I'm talking about the scientific method here, some kind of a process by which you, you answer questions, gather information, come to a conclusion and that informs and creates new knowledge in here and that is the biggest thing that the scientific method does and the whole process of science does is to gather and gain um, to gather information ask questions answer questions and gain knowledge so with that in mind just bear that in mind that is what i am referring to as the scientific method um or, or at least at its basic most proper thing not the exact method necessarily of ask a question hypothesis do experiment or what have you that is a whole process yes um but i'm more concerned about the process itself where did that idea for having a process come from and you know which cultures valued having that process as they as they grew in society and you're going to see that that whole origins of the scientific method in the ancient world um and i'm talking way before europe became a thing um, way before Europe and the modern world became a thing, back into the ancient world, where did that come from that it was so, so which cultures really valued it? Um, and how did it get around to being in Europe? Because you're going to see Europe, Europe, well, let's just dive into it. That might be a better way to do it. So most people, I think, in, when they're students of science history, where they go with who came up as the father of the scientific method, they do tend to start with um, Roger Bacon. 
Roger Bacon was a monk um, in the 13th century in Europe. Um, he's an English monk, and he described it very clearly in his writings what he thought a, a scientific method was in that repeating cycle, the repeating process of observation, hypothesis, experiment, um, but also with independent verification. Was something he very much added um, to it alongside of uh, the person who inspired him, Robert Grist. Ugh, gross testy. I, I butchered the pronunciation. I apologize. I don't know how to pronounce that one right. Sorry. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, so it's, it's, that's, that's where most people think. And yes, for those of you wondering the modern name, the scientific method, the modern name of it, the words do come from the English. That's where we take it from. Um, do come from the English and from Europe and from Western culture. And that's totally fine. But that's just the name of it. As you might guess here from what I've got above that, you can probably tell there's some things above what I've highlighted. There's a heck of a lot that went into the scientific method before that. <laughs> and a whole lot of things were going on at the same time in the ancient world that suggested that multiple cultures, um, multiple races and cultures across the ancient world were actually very much very much thinking of this idea of a process to answer questions. How do we do this? What is the method? What do we think is the best way to do it? And there was a heck of a lot of debates going on at the time in the ancient world of this is what it should be um, in here. So you, you got to notice it's 1200. This is about when the European Renaissance started um, here. So after the fall of the Roman Empire, it was the Dark Ages in Europe. Um, wasn't the Dark Ages everywhere else. There was a lot of progress in things elsewhere in the world, which ended up informing things that went on to be, um, be important in Europe. You have to understand that the Renaissance in particular, Europeans um, rediscovered a lot of things that were going on in the ancient world, but they also had interactions with... Um, also had interactions with other cultures at that point that brought those ideas back. And of course, they had progressed further than the Europeans at the time with the idea of that process of answering questions, the idea of some kind of scientific method, although it hadn't even been officially named such in the English language until the 1200s. So if we go back further, though, this is where the history gets really, really, really interesting to me um, personally. So... You do have way, way back the idea and in finding in the historical literature, probably one of the oldest known thing thoughts of that some kind of uh, some kind of pr practical objective process for answering questions, particularly as related to medicine and providing evidence that medicine in Egypt was practiced as a quantifiable science. And there's definitely a couple of references here. And I should mention, um, Wikipedia provides a really great summary, which is why I'm using it here. But I did look through a lot of the sources that they use, and a lot of the sources are very legit. They're very good with this particular stuff with Wikipedia at this time. Normally, I would not use it, but um, I did actually find this a good summary, and a lot of the sources um, that they used here in Wikipedia were good. So go, f go for that um, in here. But, um, so yeah, the Edwin Smith papyrus actually contains a, um, really lot of advice on this is how you go about answering medical questions related to science. So remember, because the process isn't exactly the same with different disciplines of science, um, you've got to look for there being a process at all, a rational kind of process that goes on with, um, science. And that's, that's where this gets really fascinating because, this is obviously very, very old, circa 1600. And I think um, if I recall, yeah, if I recall correctly, some of the um, early, so this, this is the earliest known roots of there being a rational process that, that, that this culture actually valued having some kind of process, um, plus process, logical linear process by which you answer questions um, it can really be traced the oldest known thing that we have can be traced back to this Edwin Smith papyrus, which is actually based on a medical textbook of Egypt at the time, uh, an ancient surgical textbook. And it was believed it contains the basic components of the scientific method. So it shows something interesting here that the Egyptians, um, way back in the way late days, and, you know, this is credited to Imhotep, which is um, one of the most well-known ancient um, engineers and scientists of, of the Egyptian um, world. Uh, he's credited as the author of the Edwin Smith papyrus, um, which details 
very clearly the examination, diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, the scientific method of medicine in ancient Egypt. So way back in the day. So this is an idea that already exists as there should be some kind of a process for answering questions, gathering data. We value this. This is really important kind of thing um, that came up in Egypt. Now, it is true, actually, if you read some of the books on the Edwin Smith papyrus, that they were also like, well, okay, we have natural causes and we have supernatural causes. And part of our process is figuring out natural versus supernatural causes of disease and illness and what have you. That's totally fine. Um, of course, remember, in the ancient world here, we're not necessarily in our own world where we're talking not just about religious religious things here, but we also have very rational and observable causes for things. Um, they thought that there could be supernatural causes for diseases as well as there could be natural causes for diseases. But nonetheless, point here being, they do have they did have, um, according to what evidence that we have, a process, yeah, and, and they mention it here in the Evers Propias, but it also contains evidence of the idea of traditional empiricism um, being the idea that evidence matters in these kinds of things. So these are two of the really oldest, these are, these are the two oldest things that we have to suggest that some kind of scientific method existed predating Aristotle. Actually, which Aristotle is somebody, um, Aristotle's a Greek philosopher that many people do credit as being the father of the uh, father of the scientific method, which is not necessarily true. He provided a lot of important components of the modern scientific method, but we can see from some of these things that it's actually older um, in Egypt and some of the Arabic um, Arabic cultures. And you're going to see there's a lot of Arabic <laughs> that comes back um, as we go go through this. Um, one of the other things, of course, yeah, Greece, Greece did a lot. Um, we were talking about the idea of having evidence, of having data, of going after things when you're going after data when you're answering questions. That really did come up in the Greek. It did not come up only in the Greek, though. So in China, in 400 BC, um, you also had the Maoist school of philosophy, which introduced its own sort of version of a method of a three-pronged approach for testing the truth or falsehood of something. So they would go at it with, like, make a statement, and then they would have this method to say, okay, is it true or is it false? Um, so that's another great example of another scientific method and i will point out actually that this here in china is actually uh well in advance of the idea of of the interaction with europe of course modern europeans did not uh reach china uh, until 1517 actually the portuguese were the first to reach china in 1517 um ad mind you not bc so it was many thousand, it was almost 2000 years after this initial incident uh, initial formation of a method by which to answer questions um, about the world and gain data knowledge and what have you and that just basic idea of there being a value to having some kind of method rational straightforward method to doing something um, it's really fascinating here that it actually happens a lot earlier than that now to be fair the Silk Road um, is one particular thing. Do I have it here? Actually, I wanted to, yeah. Um, so yeah, to put, to put it this way, Portugal, most adventurous of the seafaring nations of Europe, made it to China in 1517. So that's well before they could have interacted with um, the, the Europeans and the, the view of the scientific method that developed in Europe in the 1200s. Uh, that said, it's not an utterly impossible that the Chinese would have had interactions with the Greeks or the Romans or the Arabics or the Indians um, well before modern, um, well before the Renaissance period in Europe and, and uh, the interaction with the Portuguese or any interactions thereafter in the 15th um, through the 18th centuries in China. Um, because the, it's, it's, there is some uh, information that suggests that the Silk Road existed, which connected China and the Far East with Middle Eastern Europe um, in the ancient years. Um, and it, it, went and it went for a while until uh, the Ottoman Empire decided, you know what, we don't want any more to do with the Chinese and canceled any trade with them. Um, that said, you got to bear in mind when you're looking at this that um, the time period that we're talking about, there wouldn't have been planes. There wouldn't have been cars there wouldn't have been trains there would have been an awful lot of walking <laughs> and if you were fortunate you had a donkey and if you were rich you had a chariot that you could go along with um or you had a cart or something that you could go with but it was still a really long trip to get from 
to get from Europe to China. But that's not to say that there wasn't the interaction um, there, as we can say, east to west trade routes. The Roman Empire um, in the first and second century did start interacting with China, but this still would have been after um, the Chinese would have started developing their own version of the scientific method um, and would have come up with their own version of the scientific method in the Mosey um, school of thought. So it's important to note that it is still after uh, they, they they still had their first uh, first kinds of interactions really after, I think, um, although there may have been a little bit closer to it. So right around the same time as they were developing their own scientific method, um, that's when they started their first interactions with Europe. That would be my best judgment here. So please don't take me as actually being utterly literal there, but that's the point I wanted to make with that. Um one of the other things, it's missing here from this timeline, but if you pull it up in the other Wikipedia article, you might notice something here. There were also, at the same time as you had a lot of things going on in um, Europe, in, in ancient Greece, you also had, in ancient India, actually, a lot of the Buddhist schools of thought, well before they ever interacted with Europeans, started to come up with... Um, started to come up with their own version of logic, of ethics, of their own method to go after um, answering questions, finding the truth of the world around them. There was a lot of that development in the ancient world, not just in ancient Greece, but in Egypt and in the less and the rest. There's a few things also in this article that I would point, and actually I can go over here, yeah. Um, so in the early kingdoms of India, here way 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 back again this is pre-aristotle so this is pre a lot of the things in greek that we tend to point greece that we tend to point to here um and there's a lot of really fascinating fascinating things in here um with the de development of many different kinds of disciplines actually that might be very well connected to science so actually we have veterinary medicine in here um somebody here was looking at the pythagorean triples um, already in this 8th century um, BC. Uh, you had astronomy going on here, a few different things. So a lot of things that today we might consider um, as being practiced sciences. Um, I'm trying to find it, but I cannot remember where it is. Shoot. <sighs> it's escaping to me. Um, so yeah, uh, first millennium BC, yeah, you had um, atomism, um, which was a form of reasoning surrounding their own scientific method, um, their own way of going about um, answering questions about the world around them was the idea of atomism. And that came up around the same time in Greece, as we saw from the other, um, from the other page. So there's a lot of really interesting things about how science developed, how technology develops. And science and technology development and history kind of go hand in hand um, with these kinds of things. So don't be surprised if you see me referring to a lot of that. Um, let's see. So let me go back here. Oh, yeah. Um, classical antiquity. There's also a lot of older stuff in the antiquity here, too, um, from the different history books here. So um, another aside from ancient Egypt in 1600 B.C., um, by the middle of the first millennium BC, one of the things that, that we notice in the Babylonian area, which is um, modern day Middle East, is the best way to describe it. It's um, Israel, Iraq, Iran, um, Syria, Sudan, um, all those particular countries in the Middle East. This is uh, Babylonia was modeled modern day. Modern day uh, map is the Middle East. Um, first millennium BCE, Babylonia. Um, astronomy had really, really evolved as the first example of scientific astronomy. It was the first and highly successful attempt at giving a refined mathematical description of astronomical phenomena. Um, all subsequent, according to the historian Asgar Abo, uh, all subsequent varieties of scientific astronomy in the Hellenistic world, in India, in the Islamic world, and in the West, if not all subsequent, endeavor in the exact sciences exact sciences, including physics, astronomy, climate, um, all the all the hard sciences that you might remember today, depend upon Babylonian astronomy in its decisive and fundamental ways. So this is the Middle East. They developed a lot of that sort of process and thought. Um, first attempt at mathematical description of atmospheric phenomena also had evidence of empiricism. Um, 
coming coming from experience and evidence um, and requiring evidence in the formulation of ideas. Empiricism is incredibly important to the modern scientific method. So that's one of the reasons I bring this up as being really, really important here. Um, and, you know, that's that's the interesting part of the process. There's a lot of fun things in here of the ancient world. So Egypt, Babylonia, India, um, China, all of them were actually developing their own kinds of ideas and their process of the scientific method. Um, so yeah, you had similar independent ideas in here. Um, so yeah, we do most often credit things to the Greeks, but I would actually argue that there was a lot of these ideas that developed around the same time. And because when you start interacting, you end up sharing ideas with each other, um, things end up growing and you learn from each other. And this is why intellectual diversity and hearing from different perspectives and viewpoints is so important because you do develop new knowledge that way because you see things from a different perspective and you develop a different process for how, um, for how things work. So um, there is a lot of great stuff from the ancient world that is connected to Egypt and Babylonia. So the Arabic cultures, India and China in particular, also had their own um, their own work in the <laughs> in the sciences involved here, which made it just really, really fascinating. So they they saw value in this kind of um, scientific process in here. Um, and even if you go go a little bit further, so in the book of Daniel, there is actually a flawed version of a clinical trial that shows up in the book of Daniel um, in the Bible. So that's another really fascinating little piece of history that shows the idea of there being a scientific method. Um, so after the fall of the Roman Empire, though, one of the things that happened, of course, is that Europe went backwards for a while, but it didn't stop the progress and development of the scientific method that had been carried on in the ancient world from all of this that we had been noticing. So yes, you had Aristotle who provided with his book, um, Organon, um, uh, yes, Organon here, uh, his collection and knowledge of logic, um, which became incredibly important as the scientific method grew and developed. Um, but it certainly wasn't the only thing. So interesting when you're reading about science, uh, about Aristotle's method of inductive reasoning, which is where he gets at experience, evidence is his kind of thing there. He didn't believe, actually, um, that you needed to repeat an experiment. He uh, talks in his book, actually, um, I'm trying to remember exactly which one it is. I think it was Organon, but he talks about Archimedes, actually. And Archimedes is wondering, he's sitting in a bathtub and he's wondering about the weight of this crown. Um, that's on the floor next to him. And so he's trying to think about how do I get the weight of the crown? And as he gets up from the bathtub, he noticed that the water lowers and he has that eureka moment of, oh, my weight displaced the water in the bathtub. So I can measure how much the water level changes. And that gives me a clue on how much the crown weighs in here. Did he need to do it repeatedly to know that was Aristotle's argument? one could argue, no, he didn't need to do that repeatedly to know that this is the kind of thing he found out through his experience, um, in there, that that was how, that was how you could do it. Um, the idea of repeated analysis and things, Aristotle in, in, in his thing though, with his idea of induction did very much introduce the idea of empiricism. Um, well, to a degree, he didn't, in, he, he didn't, in, in, utterly included um altogether because he didn't think you needed to repeat things necessarily to have multiple lines of evidence or anything like that um or at least that's from my reading of it if somebody else knows more please feel free to correct me i'm totally game to to hear more from from others um in here because i've been reading about all of this myself one of the fun fascinating things though is that while things went backwards in europe very much um in, in, in the first through the 12th centuries when you had Islam in the Middle East and the golden age of Islam with the caliphate in the Middle East, you had a lot of Muslim scientists who developed a huge number of things in using experiment and quantification. The idea of experimentation to, to um, combine observations and experiments and rational arguments, that really came to the fore when you had... Um, Muslim scientists really get involved in that creation of that. And I'm just thinking, where is it? Yes. Um, so, so one of the arguments is maybe it's actually this Muslim scholar, uh, Ibn al uh, who actually came up with the idea of the scientific method. Um, 
So if you dig a little deeper, the, this is uh, from Real Clear Science providing a nice little summary of this. You can actually get into the idea of the scientific method. And he believed, um, so far as we know, that the endless quest for the truth in the natural world, he believed, brought, it close, brought him closer to God. Um, so he really did come into the idea of um, having evidence to elucidate the theories that he came up with. Um, the duty of man who investigates the writing of scientists of learning the truth is his goal is to make himself an enemy of all that he reads and attack it from every side, he wrote. He should suspect, him, uh, well, he should suspect himself as he performs a critical examination of it so that he may avoid falling into either prejudice or, le or leniency. Excuse me. It's interesting. Um, he was he really brought up the idea of critical thinking and skepticism. And most scientists that you meet nowadays, they are massively skeptical. I know when I peer review a paper myself, I am really, really hard. I try to be very, very, very hard on a paper so that it can, no one can work out all of its bugs, um, which usually makes my reviews of a paper very long. But um, this is, this is where it gets interesting because he really, in his book of optics, actually brought up a lot of the idea of being really critical, repeat analysis, independent verification, do all those kinds of things that we now know very much are in part of the scientific method today is the idea of repeat analysis, repeat verification, make sure it's reproducible. Can somebody else come across it? Um, yeah, Ibn al-Hotham introduces the experimental method um, and combines observations, rational arguments in his book of optics. So this happened around 1021. And the reason this matters as you jump over to this point is this is about the same time that the Crusades happened also. Um, and one of the things that the Crusades did is, yes, the Crusades were nasty. The Crusades were awful. Um, we can look back on that and we know it was, it was a horrible, horrible time. Um, for both Europe and the Middle East. It actually ended up being pretty bad for both, if I recall correctly. Could be wrong. This is not a commentary on the Crusades. Um, but one of the things that happened as a byproduct of the Crusades is that the Europeans who went to the Middle East to fight came back bringing back the ideas of the Muslim scientists on how to do science. Um, and so that's one of the things that ended up informing European, um, European views of science alongside of the idea of the ideas of Aristotle um, and the older ideas of the Egyptians that were rediscovered as part of the European Renaissance in here. So it's really fascinating. So you have Arabic cultures in particular came, came very much along the lines of there needs to be some kind of method um, to answer questions. We need some kind of method to answer questions and get at the truth. And it was interesting. I think actually, yeah. Uh, um, Oh, shoot. Uh, one of the poly one of the Persian um, scientists, also Muslim, at the same time, around the same time as uh, Ibn al, al Hatham, and I'm going to butcher the name, um, didn't like Aristotle's methods of induction all that much. So that was that is an interesting commentary there too. But I, I bring this up because it's really really fascinating to see that you had uh, Greek, you had Indian, you had Arabic, um, you had Chinese. All of them around the same time in the BC area getting into getting into what is a good we need some kind of method. They saw value in having some kind of straightforward method to answer questions and gather knowledge about the world around them, to learn more about the world around them. Aristotle writes this in his books, and I think it is quite true of human nature. We have a desire to know. We want to know about the world around us. We want to know what's going on, why things are the way they are, um, and learn more about that. Um, learn more about that from that process. And I think the desire to know is innately part of human nature, is what I believe. The desire to know is innately part of human nature. And because of that, we want to develop, there, there was a, an idea, there was a sincerely a value given to having some kind of process to answer questions in an objective and rational manner that you end up with data, um, knowledge about the world around you that you can use and apply in decisions. Um, and a lot of cultures actually saw the value in that. So if we go back up in here and in the other um, thing, you know, Indi Indian culture um, at the beginning in the Buddhist schools, which were, which were quite prominent in that point, at that point in India, really did value it. Uh, value the idea of having some kind of a process. What that process came to be, of course, in Europe, 
Yes, it, it certainly, it certainly, Europe did have a lot of influence on the world after, uh, in the 1200s and after spreading, spreading their own culture around the world and spreading their knowledge of the scientific method, I, their version of the scientific method or helping other cultures advance. But many cultures actually valued the scientific method um, or valued something akin to the scientific method that we know today. They valued the idea of some kind of objective straightforward process to actually um, answer questions and answer the world around them. So what I would say as to the origins of the scientific method is it is most certainly not the product of any one culture. It is most certainly not the product of any one race. Um, it is absolutely valued um, in history. It can be shown to be valued in history by multiple societies, multiple cultures, multiple races across the world before they ever interacted with Europe. Because as I was talking about with China, it was 1517 when the Portuguese finally landed, though there's evidence that they may have acted, interacted with the Greeks and the Romans, the ancient Greeks and Romans, via the Silk Road. But that would have been really, really challenging because it's over land and it would have been very slow travel, any number of different things there. But there's evidence that they could have interacted. Um, in India, you would have had... Um, whoops go away. Vasco da Gama didn't sail from Portugal to reach India until 1497. Um, there, so that would have been the earliest interaction India would have had with the uh, Europeans of the Renaissance age when they started going around the world and, and, and reaching out to different um, cultures here. Um, so, and the same thing can be said in Southern Africa. It was, it was the Portuguese. The Portuguese were prolific sailors um, in the 1500s, uh, 1400s and 1500s. They reached Southern Africa in the 1400s by sea um, also. So there was a lot of those things, though, that developed in the ancient world. There was serious value given to having some kind of a process. It was paired with other beliefs because, like I said, the Egyptians did say there's supernatural causes as well as natural causes for diseases. And we know now that maybe that's not true. Um, no, actually, we know now for modern medicine that that's not true. But they still had a rational process to try and figure out the answer to medical questions, to figure out astronomical questions, as we see in Babylonia. For the uh, for the Islamic cultures, with the with the rise of empiricism in and developing the, an ex serious, exact experimental method um, in here. Aristotle believed in in the world being real and learning the truth by experience. It was Muslim scientists, though, who came up with the idea, who, who really pushed seriously the idea of having data, of having evidence and things in there. So it's really fascinating. And because of that, I would very much say that the origins of the scientific method are very much human, generally. And I mean human in the sense that multiple cultures started developing it in the ancient world. Multiple cultures really valued it. With the interaction with different cultures, of course, you had changes and things going on. And yes, you did have... You did have some bad influences from different, different cultures and societies. I am not knocking and dismissing the war, the wars and um, different colonial activities and what have you. I'm not dismissing that, but other cultures were developing it anyway. At this point, so it's very much possible that it, I think I think it very much is that multiple um, societies and communities. Um, cultures and races around the world saw value in the idea of a process by which one can answer questions about the world around them, gather data, whether it be by experience or actual empirical measurement somehow, um, and then come to a conclusion and have that build the knowledge of the community. And that includes the ancient world of China, India, Greece, Egypt, Babylonia. All of them had some kind of process, and those are the roots from which the scientific method comes today. And I harp on the values thing because it has been said that um, <laughs> it has been said that the uh, scientific method that emphasizing valuing the scientific method, emphasizing the scientific method, and that kind of approach and quantitative analysis and what have you, is part of Western culture and exclusively a part of Western culture. That doesn't seem to be very true when you look at the history of it, because how many different cultures saw some kind of value in having a process, and particularly Arabic culture saw in seeing some kind of value in having quantifiable um, evidence of different things. For crying out loud, actually, the 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 um the numerals that we use, the the one two three here, like this one, that comes from the Ar Arabic countries, from the Muslim world. It's not Roman numerals; it's Arabic numerals. 
we use Arabic numerals for just about everything. <laughs> we don't use Roman numerals. Roman numerals are clumsy. Um, anyway. I, I, it's not distinctly Western. It's not distinctly purely Western. Indeed, a lot of Western world is based on that. Yes, but the to say that to say that it is an assumption that is of white culture. No, of white culture of Western culture. I think is the proper way to say it um, because because I I don't think you necessarily should apply um, values on the basis of race here. I don't think that's a wise idea. Um, here and you know that that's not true that's not true that only western culture values the scientific method that is definitively not true if you look at the science why would it have developed in other parts of the world um particularly before you could ever have had interactions with what became known as the west with before you could ever have interactions with western culture the scientific method or versions of it, processes by which to answer questions, gather knowledge about the world around you, developed independently in different parts of the world, in different parts of the ancient world. These cultures saw value in it. Therefore, I say to you, I, I say very strongly, I, I very much view valuing the scientific method as a human value. And it's a human value. You as an individual can choose to value it. You can choose not to value it. That's your choice. If you value science and evidence, uh, if you value evidence and reason and a rational approach to solving questions and a process by which you solve, answer questions, a linear process by which you solve questions, um, then yeah, awesome. Good on you. If you don't, fine. That's your, that's your bag, not mine. And the same thing can go for societies. If societies see value in having a process by which to answer questions, particularly to inform decision making, good on them. If they don't, fine that's the choice of that society i don't particularly think that's a good thing but um because <laughs> i think having some kind of straightforward process by which one can answer questions and repeat the experiment and make sure you have the truth before you go make a decision off of that is important but that's just me again my opinion on that um in there so the scientific method is very much valuing the scientific method is a human value because of its growth and we can see that from its growth um, in multiple parts of the ancient world um, as the origins of science. So I, I'm i very much in that camp. Um, I know others may not agree with me on that. That's fine. If you have comments or thoughts, feel free to add them um, below. It's much appreciated in the comment section. I would be curious to hear your thoughts. You're welcome to look at all of this. Of course, every single resource that I have on it will be linked um, in the description below so that you can go read and find more yourself. Um, and I would welcome the conversation and the discussion because to me, uh, the scientific method is very much a human value. And I say this in part because also I've interacted with scientists from all over the world um, when I go to conferences. And a lot of them are scientists who never meet uh, somebody from, from uh, America or from Canada or from Europe um, until they go to an international meeting. That's just the way it is. They, they, they end up doing science themselves, learning the scientific method or their version of the scientific method for their discipline in, um, in different, in, in whatever part of the world that they come from. Um, so I do very much believe the scientific method is a human development. It's a human invention. Um, and very important to, to Western culture. Yes, it is very important to Western culture, but not only to Western culture. I would say it's important to many cultures, actually. Um, as we've shown in the history books here. Um, so I would welcome that. So I think that's it for me. Scientific method, very complicated origins in the, in the, um, <laughs> in the ancient world with, uh, with the Arabic, with Egypt and Babylonia and India and Greece and China, all having something to do with it in terms of what we now know as the modern scientific method. And if you want more on all the different schools of reasoning that have come up in the debate on what the scientific method should be in history, um, Karl Popper's The Logic of Scientific Discovery is a good one. Um, I, you can also browse through the, the commentary on um, the idea of rationalism versus realism and anti-realism and hypothetical deductivism um, and inductivism and deductivism. These are all thoughts of scientific reasoning that go on to, of course, inform what a scientific method should be. So that's why I kind of bring them up as being important. And the idea of empiricism, um, any number of different things. It's very interesting um, things to see here so i encourage you to go check it out to go read and learn more um and you know tell me what you think if you think i i, I missed something tell me i'd be happy to hear it because this is a hell of a topic to dive into so i know i missed something um 
so yeah, if you like this video, like, share, subscribe, comment, all that jazz. Um, here, uh, also, if you really want to interact with me and talk on all of this, head over to cyworthy.locals.com. Um, that is where I will be interacting most often with folks on these kinds of topics and other things. So scientific method, awesome origins, complicated origins, very interesting history, and as brief as I could describe it here <laughs> with all of its different parts, I am still reading and going through it myself, but I wanted to get something out and talking about this, um, and very much valued by so many different cultures across the world, um, and both in the ancient world and today, I would say. There's a lot of cultures that value it today, too, um, not just Western culture. Um, anyway... That's it, I think, here. So until next time, signing off, uh, I'm Adrian. Stay curious, my friends.